Thank you, Dr. Cherry, and thank you all for being here. And I saw Dr. Kumar running out, so maybe I want to thank him. He emailed me yesterday and said I had 25 minutes and he would rebut me in five. So anyway, so this is the question. Is alginic stem cell transplant for myeloma a phoenix, which you know will rise from the ashes with all these novel immunotherapies that are now coming out? Or is it a dead horse? And these are my disclosures. So I'd like to quote from a very good friend of both Dr. Kumar and I, who in an editorial on blood raised the following, that you know, like a second marriage, the continued pursuit of safe and effective allogeneic stem cell transplantation for myeloma appears to be a triumph of hope over experience. So what I don't know if Dr. Stewart actually realizes that statistics have shown that 50% of first marriages end up in divorce and 67% of second marriages end in divorce. So if we have a 30% cure fraction, he's right, but we have a 30% cure fraction. So it's a question, is the, half, but the glass half empty or the glass half full? So let's first dispel the doubt, okay? A graft versus myeloma effect exists. You can give donor lymphocyte infusions and a subset of patients with active disease have a complete remission. That's actually led to the development of chimeric antigen receptor T cells that exploit the fact that lymphocytes can kill myeloma cells. So let's talk about a patient. This is a 44 year old, this is a true patient, presents with ISS stage three, gets RVD times four, has an auto transplant and within three months is progressing. So quickly, how many of you would offer this patient an aloe transplant right then and there? I know you're not asleep, and I guess it's gonna take that nobody raised their hand. Why not? Because you think it never works? You think it's too toxic? And now I'm gonna say I think you're too shy, okay? <laughs> Is there any other treatment can offer this patient long-term disease control? So just think about that. So why should allogeneic transplant work? It's a chemosensitive disease. There's multiple targets, as we've seen from David Avigan's very elegant trial. There is a demonstrated graft versus myeloma effect. There's no sanctuary sites. It's not a rapidly tr proliferating tumor. And I'm the first to say, look, the obvious, we're having this debate because it doesn't work all the time. So why does it not work? So let's first look at one of the largest trials that we're done looking at the role of allogeneic upfront for standard risk myeloma patients. This was BMTCTN 0102, very large study. Patients who had an HLA identical donor with the fa within the family were randomized to an allogeneic transplant as consolidation after an auto transplant. Those who had no HLA identical donor within the family got a tandem auto, and at this time there was no prescribed maintenance. There, there was randomization for uh, thalidomide dex versus no maintenance therapy. So as you could see from that curve, there was no benefit in regards to progression-free survival and overall survival in the standard risk patients. There were not enough high-risk patients to be able to do a quantitative analysis, but the early analysis did not show a benefit. So two years ago, we actually did a long-term follow-up of this trial, and this is being prepared for, present, for manuscript presentation. So now we have an, you know, the patient who's farther out is almost out seven years, so really long-term follow-up. The curves are similar for standard risk disease in regards to progression-free survival and overall survival, but look at high-risk disease. So there is a trend towards a significant progression-free survival benefit for patients who got an auto followed by a reduced intensity allo. Now one of the things here is that the reduced intensity aloe was fludarabine low-dose TBI, which many of us consider an inadequate conditioning regimen for patients with myeloma. And as we would expect, all that benefit is due to a significant reduction in the risk of relapse. Unfortunately, there is a significant increase in non-relapse mortality. So if we could abrogate non-relapse mortality, we would be able to actually make a significant dent into these curves and start the role for cure. Because I actually would postulate when you know, talk about cure, those persons who are out 10 years without relapse, they're likely to die from something else. 
And in my book, that's cure. So just compare, and this is Shaji's paper, about what happens with people with multiply relapsed myeloma depending on their response. They don't do that well. Yes, we have boatloads of drugs, but even with combination, Pollux and Castor, you saw it today, you know, 17 months progression-free survival, 30 months in people in first relapse. So people who multiply relapse are destined to die from their disease. So more and more of us are exploring the role of allogeneic transplant as salvage therapy for the multiply relapsed patient, particularly for younger patients. Because remember, if you're 60 and you've got multiply relapsed myeloma, your average life expectancy is less than five years. And now that I'm 60, that means a lot, okay? <laughs> so if you didn't have myeloma, your average life expectancy is 25 years. So multiply relapsed myeloma is stealing from our patients 80% of their expected lifespan. So we really need to do better. Now, this is long term. So look, what you're looking is no, those are not months, okay? Those are not weeks. Those are years of follow up of the large registry data from the EBMT. And what you see in green is the survival and progression-free survival curves of patients with multiply relapsed myeloma. So two things come about. There's a plateau on the curve. It's not a great plateau. I wouldn't, you know, if it was buy, sell, or hold, you'd say, I don't know, I wouldn't buy it. But at least it gives us the building block to say, if we can cure a fraction of patients with multiply relapsed myeloma with an allogeneic transplant, we should be able to build upon it, particularly because non-relapse mortality rates continue to decrease as years go by. So the one thing, allo transplants like wine, it doesn't get worse, it gets better with age. But the other thing that I think we should note is the relapse rate is, is really high. And I think as we start talking about all these immunotherapeutic maneuvers, these are maneuvers, so think about fusion vaccine, the way that David Avigan and his group thinks about it. Thinks about, you know, CAR T cells afterwards. Think about checkpoint blockade. So there's a lot of strategies that we can use over the single platform that has been able to achieve long-term disease control in patients with multiple relapsed myeloma. And this is just, it's across all donors. So I think the other, you know, now what's the data? So this is actually the, but uh, Francesca did a donor versus no donor analysis in patients who had relapsed after their initial primary therapy, showing a significant survival benefit for patients who had donors, because obviously those are the ones who went through an allotransplant. One of the interesting observations that both the group in Spain has made, and this has been confirmed by the group in the CIBMTR, is that when you relapse after an allo, you actually do better than when you relapse after an auto. And the question comes up is, because now you have a normal immune system. Because most people who relapse after an allotransplant are 100% donor. They're not host. So a lot of the immune therapeutic maneuvers that we are trying to exploit, including monoclonal antibodies, may actually work better in the context of an allogeneic platform than in the context of an autologous platform. Um, everybody has a donor now. So with post-transplant cyclophosphamide, we can do mismatch unrelated, we can do mismatch related, this is transformational. This is the European data for patients, chemosensitive disease, obviously doing a lot better than chemorefractory disease. Most common cause of treatment failure, relapse. This is the Hopkins data, patients achieving a complete remission, getting a haploidentical transplant, actually do very well. And this also shows you who are we going to transplant. And we do really need to take patients to transplant with minimal disease, either VGPR or, be or better. Doing allotransplants as a Hail Mary strategy rarely works. Uh, you know, transplant is not a static course, okay? There is new novelties. I know many of you might not believe it, but we are moving away from pushing the drugs, pouring the cells, and praying that it all works out, okay? So this is a novel radioimmunoconjugate in an allo transplant developed in Seattle, multiply relapsed myeloma. Those curves are actually very good. And the non-relapse mortality rate with this strategy is actually very low. 
So we continue to do allo transplants, particularly as salvage. This is a, um, uh, when we did the consensus conference, this is, you know, the uh, agreement in the group about where's the role for auto and where's the role for allo. You can see that the group for allo was all over the place. There was no agreement on a group of 25 experts in a room. But I think, you know, again, for me, allo transplant's a platform. It's a platform for modern immunotherapy. And we now have tools beyond which we only had before, which was donor lymphocyte infusions, that will allow us to exploit the donor immune system and make the myeloma more recognizable and produce long-term disease control. We talk about persistence of CAR T cells. Donor lymphocytes live forever. So why is allogeneic transplant not working? Well, it may not affect the myeloma stem cell. I don't think so. We do get cures. I do think it's difficult to separate the graft versus myeloma effect from graft versus host disease. And that is something that I think we need to exploit. And Dr. Gunter Kony, when he was in our institution, gave us, I think, a way forward. There are many mechanisms of immune expect. We're starting to look at overexpression of PD-1, pd one and the loss of HLA, similar to what Dr. Vago saw in AML. Again, we have to find good conditioning regimens for these patients. And fludarabine melphalan is the most commonly, but it might not be the best. And I actually think radioimmunotherapy or other forms of alkylating agents may be better. And once again, I think we have to stop doing, pushing the drugs, pouring the cells, and praying that it works out. So lots of things to explore. This is, so this is um, the Homofit data with flumel bortezomib. 74% in two years, this led to a national study that unfortunately was closed due to poor accrual. This is Gunter's data that was, uh, this is just to show you that people with three to four lines of prior therapy, progression-free survival, and now approaching five years is approximately 30 to 40%. So this is actually the platform that we're building upon. Gunter started with WT1 CTLs, we're looking at checkpoint blockers and other, and other uh, lymphocyte infusions post-transplant. And this is the long-term follow-up of his data. Uh, this one we've already seen. So in conclusion, successful myeloma therapy has targeted the immune system either directly or indirectly since the beginning. For the first time, we now have multiple treatment strategies that target the immune systems in different ways. Monoclonal antibodies, immune modulatory drugs, and allogeneic transplant. Unfortunately, because of issues that I won't go into, checkpoint blockade, which for us would have been a very promising strategy to explore, has been difficult to explore in myeloma because of the issues of pembrolizumab. Although we are with different checkpoint inhibitors, we want to explore this. We think that post-transplant vaccinations may actually also enhance the anti-myeloma effect of an allogeneic transplant. So I want to finish by showing Saji this cartoon. <laughs> Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Thank you very much for your attention.